Hey there Star Wars fans, and welcome to another episode of Ashmet Productions. For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the Old Republic. Today, I'll be going over all of the stages in a Jedi's life, right from youngling to grandmaster. I'll be speaking about how they learn and develop in the Force, the responsibilities that they have to take on at each stage, and much more. Enjoy. The Jedi Youngling, or Initiate, was the first stage of a Jedi's life. Four sensitive children were found across the galaxy and brought to the Jedi Temple on Coruscant for training. All of the children selected would have to be under the human age of two, or whatever the age was relative to the species in question. For example, Yoda may not have had to be brought to the temple until the age of about 20. Older children were occasionally brought to the temple for training, for example Anakin Skywalker, who was found at the age of nine. But they would almost always skip out the youngling phase and go straight to being Padawans, which we will get onto later. When the children arrived at the temple, they would be divided into clans with others very similar in age to them. These clans generally comprised of up to 20 students, but it was not unheard of to have clans of 5 students. However, that is the lowest number on record. These clans worked, trained, ate and slept together. For their first few years in the temple, the younglings participated in basic force training exercises and rituals. Then, age 4, or when the majority of the group had reached that age, so Yoda's species would have the same two or three years on force training as a human child, younglings were first introduced to lightsabers and began basic training exercises, for example, deflecting blaster bolts from training droids. They practiced these with lightsabers owned by the Order, on a very low power so as not to injure themselves. Then, at the age of 9 or 10, or again when each species had had the same amount of training time so far, the younglings would be taken to Ilim to take part in the gathering and collect their crystals. If you want to know more about this, then I'll link my video on it in the corner now. The younglings continued with their training until they were about 18, or whatever age that made them depending on their species. However, this age was lowered to around 13 during the Clone Wars, due to the need for an increased number of Jedi. The younglings were taught by Grand Master Yoda and Master Terra Sanube, who instructed them on lightsaber combat and skills, force reflexes and basic force skills such as force push, force jump, force run, etc. The younglings were also taught about Jedi in galactic history, current affairs and languages, amongst other things. Often, guest Padawan speakers were invited to give talks to the younglings to teach them about their experiences and lessons that they had for the younglings. Like when Ahsoka Tano spoke about how she had recovered her stolen lightsaber in the second season of The Clone Wars. The next stage of a Jedi's life is becoming a Jedi Padawan or Apprentice. This was when a youngling would be further trained in the Jedi arts by a Jedi Knight or Master. A common misconception is that a Jedi has to be a Master in order to train a Padawan, as Padawans refer to their teacher as Master. However, a Jedi can be either a Knight, a Master or even a Grandmaster to train a Padawan. Jedi who wanted to teach an apprentice would choose their Padawans of the selection of younglings that were ready. The younglings would have to fight each other to the best of both of their force and combat abilities and if any of the Jedi liked them, they would be taken on as apprentices. However, during the Clone Wars, such was the need for new Jedi, that the Council just assigned Padawans randomly to Jedi, as we saw with Ahsoka and Anakin. Younglings not selected would go into other fields of the Jedi Order, such as agriculture or information. The Padawans would then go through about 5-10 to 10 years of one-on-one -on -one training with their Master. When the Master felt that the Padawan was ready to move on, they would put them forward to take the Jedi Trials. There were nine parts to these trials. Teamwork, isolation, fear, anger, betrayal, focus, instinct, forgiveness and protection. These steps were designed not only to test the Padawan's ability in the light side of the Force, but also their resistance to the dark side. The steps were, where possible, broken down into three parts, physical, mental and combat. Physical may be things like acrobatics, for mental they would be either force related or for something like anger, a vision may have been put in the Padawan's mind, and combat would be hand to hand fighting and lightsaber skills. Some trials would be expeditions, like the trial of teamwork or the trial of isolation. Sometimes though, Jedi did not actually need to take the trials, they may have had one ordeal that gave them instant promotion to Jedi Knighthood. For example, Obi-Wan Kenobi did not have to take the trials, his ordeal with Darth Maul was viewed as proof enough. This also happened frequently during the Clone Wars. If the Jedi passed all of the trials successfully, they would be granted the rank of Jedi Knight. The next and often longest, and sometimes last, phase of a Jedi's life is knighthood. 
The Jedi Knights were the forefront of the Order and famed throughout the galaxy. Most Jedi would stay as Knights for the rest of their lives. As Knights, Jedi would get the opportunity to train Padawans, lead missions, discover new pieces of galactic history and so on. The role of the Jedi Knight changed greatly over the centuries. During the time of the Old Republic, Jedi Knights were commanders and generals in the Republic Army, a role they were prized again during the Clone Wars. During peacetime, the Jedi Knights would run missions like guarding borders, acting as bodyguards to important figures, running relief missions and going on personal expeditions with the Force. There were three paths that a Jedi Knight could choose, those being a Jedi Guardian, a Jedi Consular or a Jedi Sentinel. The Jedi Guardian focused on their skills in lightsaber combat and battle. They were often thought of as the light side versions of Sith warriors. The Guardians were characterised by the most common colour of lightsaber amongst them, which was blue. The Jedi Guardians were split into four main categories, amongst which were many subdivisions. Exotic Weapon Specialist was the first, and these were Jedi who used and taught skills in a variety of weapons that differed from the standard single blade lightsaber. These weapons included double bladed lightsabers, light whips, lightsaber pikes and blasters. One notable exotic weapon specialist was Mace Window. The second variant was the lightsaber instructor. These were the guardians who taught lightsaber skills across the order. The head lightsaber instructor was known as a battle master, though this was originally a title given to Jedi who performed significant feats in battle. A famous lightsaber instructor was battle master Sin Jedi. The third type of Jedi guardian was the Jedi Ace. These were expert Jedi pilots under the Jedi Starfighter Corps. They used their Force abilities to achieve feats in a Starfighter that non-Force sensors would not have been able to achieve. During wartime, they commanded fleets in the Republic Navy, and during peacetime, they worked closely with local defence authorities to ensure the safety of star systems. One such Jedi Ace was Anakin Skywalker. The final type of Guardian was a Jedi Peacekeeper. These were probably the most recognised and largest variant of the Jedi Guardian, and they were responsible for law enforcement and the keeping of the peace across the galaxy, particularly in the Outer Rim. They often worked with sect police and local militias. Terra Sanube was one notable Jedi Peacekeeper. The second type of Jedi Knight was the Jedi Consular. Jedi Consulars, led by the Council of Reconciliation, focused on the Force and diplomacy, refraining from using their lightsabers where possible, which often came in the colour green. There were six main variants of the Jedi Consular, the first being the Jedi Ambassador. Jedi Ambassadors would often be called upon to meditate treaties between worlds and act as liaisons between worlds wanting to enter the Republic. Jedi Ambassadors only served as a face for the Republic. They did not make policy or decisions. That was left to Jedi Diplomats. Jedi Diplomats negotiated treaties and solved political disputes on behalf of the Republic, using the Force to reach balanced decisions. The third type of Jedi Consular was the Jedi Healer. These Jedi used their compassion and connection to the living force to heal others. During war times, they could often be found on battlefields and in troop hospitals. So yes, the concept of using the force to heal people was around in canon long before the rise of Skywalker. The Jedi Lawkeeper was the fourth type of Jedi Consular. They were made up of the Jedi Archivist, the Jedi Historian and the Jedi Librarian. It was their job to maintain and keep the Jedi Archives. Jocasta Nu was one such lawkeeper. Jedi researchers also worked with the archives and the lawkeepers. Their role was to update the archives as biologists, geologists, mathematicians, archaeologists, etc. The last type of Jedi consular was the Jedi Seers. These Jedi were highly attuned to the unifying force and were gifted with precognition, the ability to see events still to come. The third type of Jedi was the Jedi Sentinel. Sentinels were a mix between the Jedi Guardians and the Jedi Consulars. They were also the most focused out of the three types on non-force skills, such as technology, medicine and security. There were six variants of the Jedi Sentinel, the first being the Jedi Artisan. Jedi Artisans used a mix of their technical skills in connection to the Force to make objects that had connections to the Force, such as lightsabers and holocons. The second type was the Jedi Investigator. These were Jedi that often worked as specialised trackers or sometimes spies, occasionally going undercover for months at a time. They worked very closely with law enforcement. The Jedi Recruiter was another type of Jedi Sentinel. These were Jedi who used their connection to the Force to search the galaxy for young, Force-sensitive children. The fourth type was the Jedi Shadow. These Jedis were similar to the Jedi Investigator, but concentrated on destroying traces of the Dark Side and the Sith Order. The most famous type of Jedi Sentinel was the Jedi Temple Guard. 
these Jedi acted as the security force of the Jedi temples. They were completely anonymous behind four white and gold robes and masks and carried double bladed yellow lightsabers. The final type of Jedi Sentinel was the Jedi Watchmen. These Jedi worked to oversee the peace on particular planets. For example, they would act as advisors to underage monarchs, like in the case of Rael Avos, or they would be advisors to a government and liaise between them and the Jedi Council. If a Jedi did well as a knight, they would be promoted to the rank of Jedi Master. Jedi Masters had the same roles as Jedi Knights, however they would often take on more dangerous and more difficult missions. In wartime, they would be the first to be promoted to generals and the top military commanders. The most prominent Jedi Masters would be part of the Old Guard. The Old Guard was an unofficial group of Jedi Masters that were expected to be asked to join the Jedi Council. Notable members include Obi-Wan Kenobi, Qui-Gon Jim, and Plo Koon amongst others. Jedi Masters were the only Jedi permitted to join the Jedi High Council, apart from Anakin Skywalker, which was the highest achievement a Jedi could attain, apart from Grand Master. The final stage of Jedi's life is one that very few Jedi have ever reached, only about 15 in the entire history of the Order, and that is the Jedi Grand Master. This was the wisest, most powerful in the Force, and the best lightsaber fighter in the Order. These Jedi were not necessarily the head of the Jedi High Council, that was the Master of the Order, who was elected by the Jedi High Council, and was served in terms like Prime Ministers in the UK or Presidents in the US, whereas Grand Master was a life commitment. However, it was possible to hold both titles, as Yoda did for several years. Just out of interest, Mace Windu did hold the title of Master of the Order at one point, just before and during the Clone Wars. The Grand Master was responsible for the executive decisions of the Order, and was the go-to Jedi in times of need for advice. The Grand Master was also responsible for training young things as well. So guys, that's it for the stages of a Jedi's life. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and turn your post notification bells on. Comment down below what your favourite phase of a Jedi's life is, and if you have any videos that you want to see in the future. May the Force be with you, and I'll see you next time on Astromet Productions.